everything started when uh, Peter Wachowska started uh, Illusion Softworks and he worked on Hidden Dangers, which was really big AAA games that were first AAA games that were released here. It was very successful. And when I saw in a magazine a screenshot of it, I was like, hey, this, this is where I want to work. And they actually already contacted me because they knew me that I'm, a, I'm actually an uh, artist. So I started as a graphic artist uh, there. So basically, uh, they were starting, a, they already had one team, it was working, they were looking for people to build, uh, to start an uh, other team and work so, on some other game. And so that was, there was a period where we were helping with Hidden Dangers, so that I worked a little bit on textures for Hidden Dangers. And then we were starting discussing uh, how we will, what's, what's next. And uh, one of the ideas I got was uh, uh, this Viking game, then there was some racing game, something like Mad Max, something. Uh, everybody, for some reason, wanted to do such games back then. Uh, and none of them were successful, actually, later. And then I get the idea to make Mafia. But at the time, it was funny, because so I, I, I came up with the idea, and I had some core design concept, basically. But I was an artist. And at the time, the artist was considered to be more valuable than the <laughs> than designers. So they didn't want it to place, put me in the, in the role of the lead designer, even if it, that it was my idea, because they valued the, art, <laughs> the artist more. So they first hired someone else, and he had to screw up first. <laughs> so they were like, oh, maybe you do it, because like, this, this is not working that much. So, <laughs> so then I became a designer after <laughs> a while, when I was working on my idea as an, just an artist. Uh, so, and then because there was only one designer, basically I was the lead designer because there was no other designer, uh, and it was like originally it was like nine people or something. So, so basically, I started to direct how it's gonna progress. So, so it was kind of like rocket start because I was from no one to to director. But when you are talking about nine people, it's uh, not it's kind of like uh, unavoidable uh, development, basically. We thought originally that it's going to be very simple because, like, we have the engine, and so basically we'll just exchange soldiers for mafia guys, and the map is going to be a little bit bigger. But we already have cars in in hidden dangers and stuff, uh, so it's going to be quite easy. But nobody actually realized that to make a big city is going to be much, much more complicated than to make a level for uh, 20 soldiers run, uh, to, to run around. So, so it became a monster project. It's probably one of the second open world city game ever. And we didn't have a clue that, that there's something like GTA being developed until like a year before release. Uh, and then we started to see the game. We had presentations for the press together. So I, I was in Germany making presentation next to the uh, computer with GTA 3. <laughs> so, so I saw the game actually as we were developing and I was like, ah, we, we are doing this better, but they are doing this better. Ah, we should add this because, uh, but it wasn't like direct competition or it wasn't that we saw the GTA previews and started to work on something uh, similar. It was absolutely, not connected together, it was just spontaneous uh, coincidence. So basically it was very stressful uh, development and it was, it took like two years more than it was originally planned. Uh, so it was really, really not very enjoyable process. And for many different reasons. So we have zero experience, so everything was a problem and nobody know how, like, we have zero experience from any other job actually. So nobody worked anywhere before that. So that means that you are also socially unexperienced. So you don't know, like, and then you put 20 people in a room and they started to argue about, like, how the air conditioning is going to work, if we are going to play music loud or everybody has to buy headphones. That was the issues we had on a daily basis. Like, so there was a guy who doesn't have headphones and was listening to music and, and we are like, no, turn it off. No, no. Everybody likes my music. No, no, I don't like it. So, so it was like really uh, 20 years old guys arguing about stuff that's absolutely forbidden in other companies, basically. So, and then uh, when you are working on 
such massive game, basically. And at the time, it was a you can hardly do something bigger. Uh, there's a lot of issues that you you, you are going to have, uh, and uh, nobody know how to face them uh, at all. But on the other hand, I learned a lot how not to do it uh, because we basically tried every thing that doesn't work uh, that we could just for the reason that we were very uh, unexperienced. Uh, so basically then, on the other hand, I had a lot of freedom there, like, like at least on First Mafia, uh, basically the influence of, of, of any outside force was very limited because, I don't know, the producer was kind of like very relaxed guy, so he did <laughs> He didn't. Now he has a pup, I guess, or something. He's not in the games industry anymore. Uh, so but he came like, ah, I like it. Okay, continue. And that was that was it. So so I have basically absolute artistic freedom, which was awesome. And it turned out to be also commercial success. This and later then there was much more, uh, much more uh, big publisher influence. Let's say so. So and it's a risk. Nobody wants to get dirty with the project so that everybody waits how it's going to end and when it's successful everybody wants to have part <laughs> of the success so so <laughs> uh, a lot of people started to uh, say how it should be and stuff uh, so so a lot of the freedom was kind of lost you know you spent four years working on something very stressful then i wrote the sequel and i basically wasn't even interested on in working the sequel personally at all. I wanted to do something else. So basically, uh, I wrote Mafia 2, I, I left the team, I started working on something else, and then I when it didn't work out, I kind of helped with the Mafia 2 a little bit, uh, and then I left. I, I lost control uh, over, the, over the stuff that I was doing, so basically, and I didn't want it to do it the way um, others wanted to do it. So basically, it was the general general uh, uh, thing, and it's usually like very very common reason for many other people. So so, and but it was at the time it was very risky because like there is there are not many other companies that would hire me in this country. So if I wanted to do the same thing, I would have to probably move abroad, which I didn't want it that much. The only other option was to start my own company, uh, and but at the time there was very kind of this startup culture or, or trend wasn't there yet, so uh, it was very tough to find investors who will, who, who, who will be willing to take some risks in a uh, thing that they don't understand. We were both experienced developers and we really didn't go back to this time of our lives when we were developing a game in our bedroom. Yeah. So we said, either we get an investor and we are able to do this professionally, or we don't do it at all. And that was actually quite challenging, because you know, once you are in a super big company before, you know, or, or in, a, in a big company, you typically have a completely different risk. What we had here is a, a risk of creating a new product, and uh, and building a company. So, so basically, when we are looking for investment, everybody was like, why don't you make some Facebook game? This is kind of hot shit today. And I was like, because I don't understand Facebook at all. I never did anything like that. And I think it's a bubble. I, I think it's not, and it was a bubble actually. <laughs> and so, so, but I think that there is a huge opportunity here because nobody's doing it. And there's a lot of people who are willing to buy this. So basically when I was going for investors, I had like, presentation with a couple pages and if you look at this uh, at it, it it's the game eventually we were introduced to mr bakala who is an investor originally from czech republic with interest in coal mining real estate and he has no like, love affair with video games he really for him it's really an investment opportunity both dan and martin they are convincing they are very good in what they are doing 
they had the past, which kind of confirmed that they, they, they are kind of good in what they are doing. We didn't do any actual development until we were able to secure uh, the investment. And then we started the actual company, rented our offices actually. Yeah, this building with a chimney is where we started and where we had our uh, first office. And we started with 13 people. And uh, in that small team, we started working on what we called vertical slice a prototype. Uh, we selected uh, CryEngine as our technology. We actually chosen the CryEngine because because the forest looked cool. I was really like, hey, it will be quite complicated to make open world RPG in this game engine, which was actually specialized for uh, first person shooters with few enemies and, uh, well, I don't know, vehicles. There were helicopters and uh, tanks and things like that. And then we had some other engines which were much more suitable for our game, I believe. But the vegetation and the countryside looks just gorgeous in the Grand Engine. So we said, okay, it will be much harder for us to make open world, huge open world RPG in this game engine, but it looks so cool that we just need it. And, and we started in 2011, September. Uh, in, in about a year and a half, we were able to have this prototype running. It looked great and we were able to start pitching it. Uh, to the publishers. Take as many men as you need and ride there. Find those names and bring me their heads. I do this out of friendships, your father. Yeah, at the beginning we decided that we want to create some part of the game, some vertical slice or prototype, where all game features will be visible and playable. So we started to work on every game system and uh, it means that a few years ago we already have everything working in the game. It, it had the feeling we wanted for the game. It was really it was really there. It was, yeah, this is this huge open uh, countryside and I can sit on my horse and go there and find some bandits and fight them and they will kill me because it's very difficult. And everything, this was there and we were quite happy on that. So we had a quite good looking prototype, I would say. Uh, and we basically visited most publishers out there and the general response was very positive I would say like they most of the people really liked it and the reason why everybody said no in the end was that they thought that it's going to be very risky uh, that, 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 and on, to, to, on their defense I would say at the time there was no next-gen consoles and everybody was super scared that the next-gen consoles are not going to sell well so basically then they would end up with a game that was very expensive to make for the platforms that are not, suc not, not successful. So they were not willing to take the risk. They always you know, said, yeah, nice, yeah, thank you, yeah. but no thank you. <laughs> Too historical, uh, uh, no miracles, you know, you know, no magic, you know, all these kind of stuff. So, and uh, we felt like uh, yeah, we were kind of pitching this game in a in a period when the fashion was uh, on something else. So it's always difficult to go against the mainstream. It's like, why, why would you create a new game studio and then make some normal, typical mainstream game? Let's, if we want to follow this dream and go for this, this uh, huge goal, then let's kick it with some really interesting and really ambitious and really great game. 
we stood in, in front of a decision like what we are doing with this project. You know, we the, 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 there was a, our investor who indeed heard the feedback like, okay, thank you, it's nice, but we are not investing like the publishers. And then that was a done. And Martin Klima, who were like stubbornly insisting on on the fact that this is a very good idea. It was absolutely <laughs> desperate. Uh, like the, the really 2013 was absolutely horrible. It was like uh, so. And, and the thing is that it, they, they don't say no immediately. So the thing is that you have some plan, uh, you have some money to execute this plan, and then there, is this, there was this moment of, okay, we spent that much money, and then we visit the publishers, and then we have three months to get signed or game over. And the period from the start of those three months to the Kickstarter was 12 months. So basically for eight, nine months, we, did, we didn't have funding. And the publishers were not saying no. They were saying, maybe if you do this to convince us, or we would like to see one more prototype, or how did you mean this? And we will have meeting in, I don't know, August, and it was, I don't know, May. So in August, we will tell you. So it was kind of like a slow process of, like slow death basically. So, and at the same time, if some of them would say yes at some time, you still had to continue to work. So, so it was at the same, at one, it looked absolutely desperate. So we were like, okay, it's not gonna work. We are gonna go bankrupt very soon. And on the other hand, we had to continue because uh, uh, if somebody said yes, all of a sudden, we would have to kind of show him that we did something in the meantime. <laughs> And, be, and we should be prepared to, to con so basically, for example, we had to hire new people and we didn't have money to, <laughs> to hire them. So we were negotiating with people that we would like to hire, but we didn't know if we will be uh, existing in a month. When this decision was not forthcoming, it uh, sapped our enthusiasm. So we came to the idea like, okay, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's do Kickstarter. It will be a confirmation of, you know, the viability of the, of the idea, because we knew that our ambitions are quite high and the cost of development will be, will be actually much higher than any Kickstarter project have ever raised at that time. So we knew we cannot kind of ask for several millions uh, so we decided that we will ask for a few hundreds and this will be indeed a very good contribution, financial contribution to what we, were, what we were doing at that time. But at the same time, it will be a confirmation of, of the idea that, that this is something people want, people are willing to kind of make a bet, you know, a different kind of bet than, than publishers. Then we had to convince the investor that, okay, so basically we are bankrupt. Uh, if you don't give us any more money, we are bankrupt. Uh, our agreement wasn't like that, so, so, so there was no uh, expectation to get any more money from, from the investor. So it was something totally unexpected on his side. Uh, so he had all the rights to basically close, close it and say, well, oh, Sorry. We had a very supporting and patient, uh, patient investor. So that was a very good thing for us. That you know, this, this. Uh, uh, but one thing is to finance a development of prototype for which you need a rather smaller group of people and uh, a rather short period of time. And a completely different thing is to basically finance the full development of, of the of, of, of game. So the Kickstarter was really the something I was like, whoa, but we have this research that says that people want it and uh, all the factors say that it's gonna be successful if we manage to do it. So 
if somebody if we find someone who will give us the money then it's not gonna fail and luckily for us when our investor heard about the Kickstarter he was like oh that's cool like like I haven't heard about this and it's some kind of interesting kind of like adventure so yeah let's try it so like we were like we pushed the button and so so now what's what happens and um, we didn't go we wouldn't go into the Kickstarter if we were not convinced that the likelihood that we will be able to reach the level we wanted is not reasonably achievable we thought yeah we can do it if you want to make some impression and some impact or, or influence or be successful you probably have to take some risks of course there are people that and even with from within the company and they were like if we were not doing this this and this we would have it so much easier and the answer is if we were not doing this this and this we wouldn't make 300,000 pounds on the Kickstarter and we wouldn't be here <laughs> And, that's, and nobody would write about us and nobody would find it interesting. We believe in this game. It's cool. We believe it's cool. We are experienced gamers, that I said. And uh, we played our game and said, yeah, this is cool. This is it. This is what we want. And I had no doubts that it will be success. Funny thing is, I, I was at some uh, game dev meeting the day it happened. So, so basically, we probably already had the like 300,000 that we asked for. But I was at some devil, there was other game developers sitting in the room and we had some kind of like uh, mini conference or, or something like that. And uh, all the time people, like somebody has some lecture there and all the time people were like, 400,000, 450. <laughs> they were shouting it at me. So it was <laughs> kind of funny. But, uh, but on the other hand, I'm not very, I'm a very pessimistic person. So generally i hardly enjoy such successes so no 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 but he was not pessimistic is he now saying that he was pessimistic oh come on <laughs> <laughs> i well, if he was he wasn't telling it's too hard to me so when i got some idea it already is very like final. So, for example, in school, when we were we were supposed to sketch something, and we were supposed to produce lots of sketches and pick one, and I usually did one, and I was like, ah, this is what I want to do. And my professor hated me for this. Like, no, 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 no. You, you are going to do 20 sketches like everyone else. I'm like, no, I like this one. I want to work on this one. I don't want to try anything else. <laughs> And I already, and the thing is that I already thought did what I want to do in my head, while other people wanted to do it on paper. I don't know. And the very similar thing is that with, with with games. So so I have an idea that I want to do. I think a lot about this idea for a very long time. So so it's not something I oh let's make it come. It's like I spent two years reading books, thinking about what I would like to do. And then, but then when I put it on paper, basically that's the game. He wants to create a game, the open world RPG set in the medieval times. And we were like, okay, it's cool because, well, it's nothing that actually you can play. So it's interesting uh, PR wise that, yeah, people will talk about the game because it's unique. But I was thinking more about uh, then when it is set into the real medieval times, then there will be some kind of real gameplay mechanics. My philosophy, let's say, is that gameplay experience generally should be natural, believable. Uh, it could be complex, but shouldn't be complicated. I believe this is the most important part of the design of the Kingdom Come Deliverance, that the uh, world behaves naturally. So uh, we actually started from the world. Like, like, okay, we will definitely have some story in the game, we will have some quests, but for the beginning, let's ignore it. And uh, uh, we started to build a world. It was 
one of our main feature to be believable and to make this world really special and with really no magical elements, very close to reality. And when we, we were beginning the work, the ambitions were very high. <laughs> we were really working hard on every detail. And my role in the beginning was to finally um, collect the proper database of images, of all the visual and text materials that can be used um, as a historical background. So when the designers had some idea about the quest, they came to me and said to me like, if I can do the research about particular area, vegetation, people, customs, art, whatever. So basically that's when the his historical research comes in uh, and also the writer's personal experience. So when you're a writer, you need to kind of get your inspiration from somewhere. Most of the writers who write from, from present, they get it from their life. So they meet people, those people are the role models for their characters and stuff. We had it much harder because my goal was really to show even the daily life as it was. So I was for like two years before we started to work on the game, I was really reading as much literature on the topic as, as, as possible. There is a great book from 19th century, I guess. It's written in kind of like very funny old Czech uh, about daily life in medieval cities. Uh, it's like 2,000 pages and it basically covers every single aspect of life. And the guy was writing it based on old chronicles. So basically he went through all the available uh, medieval chronicles in Bohemia and all the mentions and stuff about different daily life stuff, uh, professions and social topics and stuff. And we were thinking, okay, so there will be people in the villages, they will go to sleep, they will go to eat, they will have some hobbies. And we started to create the world which works and is believable. So everyone has some hobbies. <laughs> Well, which is mostly going to the pub. By the way, the drunken priest is the uh, face of my father. Um, <laughs> and I don't think he saw the cutscenes yet. Uh, but I told him that it's a really horrible <laughs> character. But they had some uh, uh, complicated systems. People may not believe me when I'm, I, because I don't want to use it as an apology for, for, I don't know, bugs or something, but it's really the most complicated thing you can do. Like, like RPG is the most complicated genre, let's say, and the way we, want, we do it is even more complicated. So yeah, there are, might be some games that have more assets, so, so they are bigger in, in scope, let's say, so for example, but our general approach to stuff like the, 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 the realism, the like actual open worldness and non-linearity of, of, of the gameplay and all those kind of simulation mechanics behind it. And it, it has actually two aspects, the AI or NPCs that actually live, live their lives. So uh, if you, I don't know, encounter some ban bandits in the woods and you want to steal their stuff, then you think they are too strong for you, so you just follow them and wait, and eventually they will go to sleep. There are people who are doing stuff that I <laughs> didn't even imagine. The guy wrote me that he basically, he cooks a potion, sleeping potion or something like that. He goes, he sneaks into human camp, puts the sleeping potion to their uh, uh, food, uh, they actually eat the food, so you can do it. It's a game mechanism that we knew about, that we planned. So they eat the food, they all fall asleep. He steals all their clothes and weapons, so they are naked. And then he waits after they wake up and they are, they are feeling like kind of like dizzy or, or, or bad. They, they, they are really fucked up by the poison or something. And then he kills the naked guys. It's kind of sociopathic behavior, 
but that's something that emerged from all of the mechanisms that we put in the game and nobody saw at first sight they are not visible so we were before we released the game we were like will anyone notice like that, that this that there is such complicated gameplay underneath uh, the, the first sight and it seems that people did and those things when they are kind of like they, it's believable it works everybody understands how it works when it, he realizes that it works differently than in other games. Oh, but it works as in real life. So, and then you need to count with those things. And then all of a sudden you have lots of new gameplay, basically for no price, because if those systems work and it's a little bit more work to, to, to make them work this way, uh, then the gameplay emerges all of a sudden, basically. And there are people who are doing stuff that I <laughs> didn't even imagine. The difficulty of this approach is in, uh, that sometimes you have to set yourself uh, limits. Because if you think about stuff and uh, you think about the player mission and you're like, okay, what if player does this? And you answer yourselves, okay, I'm gonna prepare a way for him. Or you can be the other way, which is the other designers often go that they will set barriers for you because they want you to do something. We do the opposite, we'll, we let you go whenever you want, do whatever you want, but there's a trick in that. Because if, uh, if you kept forever thinking, what if the player does this and this and this, you will never finish the game. So sometimes you have to be like, okay, we have to put a stop sign here and be like, okay, you can't do this because there will be too much work and the production would be just, we would do the game forever. And then we said, okay, now we want to put some quests and story into this world but suddenly we realized that it's very easy because it was like I don't know now you need to talk to this guy and we were okay so this guy will probably wait for you at the blacksmithy or something and then we realized that he isn't waiting because it was already the evening and he went to the pub but suddenly we realized that it's not a problem at all that uh, you just go to the blacksmithy find out that the blacksmith who was there, who was meant to be waiting for you is not there, so you just go to the pub and yeah, he was there. So you could, uh, it was at the end, most of the quests were very easy to put uh, into this living world, because again, it all works, worked naturally, and uh, players very quickly started to expect it that and weren't surprised when they didn't find someone or he was sleeping and they needed to uh, wait for him for the morning or something like that. Let's just say that the biggest difference between our game and other games is not actually the historical realism or accuracy or whatever. It's the general pacing and content of the gameplay. So basically, and so, so, so it was, when we started the company, I wrote a blog about it, that about the potato landscape, for example. So, men, most of the games have, and RPGs especially, has very compressed world. So basically, every 50 meters there's something, like dungeon, enemies, encounter with uh, some monsters and stuff. We don't. Our landscape is very natural. You really have to travel two kilometers when until you found something. So you can run encounter some random random stuff during travel, but it's surely not as often as in other games. It was a huge risk to, to do it this way, because like then we risked that everybody would say, like, this game looks good, but it's boring, nothing happens. I, I, I rode my horse for 10 minutes and nothing happened. Nobody attacked me, there's no combat, there's nothing to find, just woods. They look nice, but boring. I'm not uh, much of a fan of the new open world games, I would say. It feels like they just take a map and just scatter a bunch of markers over it. And they're like, okay, there's like 50 different places where you can pick up a flag and you collect them all. Hey, and it's, uh, I feel it's like this cheesy instant gratification for players. Also, there's lots of dialogues uh, for initial five or seven hours. There's only three combats. There is a 12 minutes or eight minutes long cutscenes interrupted by two minutes of gameplay and followed by another four minutes of other cutscene. And everybody's like, oh, this dialogue is so fucking long. It's gonna be extremely boring. No, everybody's gonna skip that. Nobody will like, I don't like the initial cutscene. 
And I, I was personally sitting behind a lot of the people at, at shows or, or by, some, by some journalists who played the game and most of them watched the cutscene and they were like, oh, these guys are so interesting. So I, and so, some YouTuber told me like, you know what's super uh, interesting about your game? I usually skip dialogues. In most games, I skip dialogues. I hate them. It's, it's like they say bullshit. It's, it's, I, I, it's boring. In your game, the dialogues are much longer. The, the people speak much, much more than in other games. And I don't skip them because I'm interested what they say because the people are interesting. And many other games, and that's, that's, that's also important, but many other games have a lot of basically artificial co combat uh, encounters because they want to prolong the gameplay. So, so they have so much com combat because they think that the game otherwise would be boring and too short. We don't have this at all. <laughs> and still people play the game for 100 plus hours. So, so and they don't, they don't complain that there's not enough uh, combat or violence or stuff. And that was the general philosophy initially and it works. That's, so, so it's very little violence necessary to finish the game. There's a lot of dialogue, a lot of interaction with people, a lot of human behavior. And because it's natural and everybody understands it and it's not that it's not boring. It's hard to write it this way. So, so a lot of other games really are not written very well. So it really is boring. But if you are able to do interesting story and write the believable characters, for example, Witcher 3 has very good written sto well written story. Uh, if you manage to do it, basically we prove that it's not important to have so much violence in the game and the ga open world game could be fun even without the violence and... Yeah, I believe that, uh, that yes, we made something special. It's not that Kingdom Come Deliverance is, I don't know, breakthrough in the open world RPGs, but I believe that uh, what we did was to show the way that it's possible to make it slightly more real without the sacrifices on the gameplay side. I think it's extremely uh, positive to see that there's enough audience to sell more than a million copies with a game that is not entirely focused on action and is hopefully smart and uh, adult or, or mature uh, uh, in storytelling and stuff. And that's, that's I think that's my biggest, uh, like, uh, most, I'm most proud of. It's, it's, a, it's something that, that's one of the reasons why everybody was afraid to give us the funding and we made them wrong and it's basically a philosophical thing. It's, it's like, in my opinion, it totally changes the, it could totally change. I don't think it will, but it could totally change the approach how to make games because it proves that there is an audience for something smarter than just action. I, I work on many, many I work on many games and uh, with many game designers and and uh, some of these experiences were more pleasurable than others. And, uh, and my experience though is counterintuitively that the quality of the game that's eventually produced is inversely proportional to the pleasurability of the interaction with the lead developer. So, or lead designer. So, if, if the person that has the vision for the game is really like easygoing, friendly person, then the game usually is not that good eventually, because it's easy to to force such a person to accept compromises. So we say this can't be done, and it's all oh, okay. No, that stuff will happen. Okay, well, it's good enough, it's okay. Yeah, while if you have somebody who really is passionate about it, and, and this word passionate is really much misused in, in video game industry, and it's really a synonym of uh, willing to work without pay. But some people truly are 
passionate and in a <coughs> in a good way and um, uh, and Dan is one of these people the thing is that to make something like this you had to be stubborn it's kind of like probably should <laughs> there's not many not stubborn people who <laughs> who are able to manage some such things but uh, I would say that when you want to achieve something some sometimes you should not take compromises so at times we of course had been at loggerheads and uh, didn't agree on everything but I, I think it's really good for the project and you can't make a good game without a strong vision and a good game will never be designed by a committee you really need one strong-willed person that's not willing to put up with less than perfection yeah. and of course Sometimes it will happen that that person wants something that's really not physically uh, possible and that can cause frustration. But overall, it's, uh, it's invaluable to, to have uh, a person that's uh, focused on, on making the best game possible. You work on something, there's finally a working prototype and it's not working or you played it and you realize that something's not sticking together very well. So then you have to think, okay, will I let it be and risk that is it going to be a problem for the users or will I change it? But it, it requires some extra money, extra time or whatever. And in the end, there is always the decision, okay, the delay or the problems are worth the risk. So, and when I go there and tell like, I don't like this, change it. I, us I usually already thought about the consequences. So I, I'm aware of about the consequences and I'm willing to take the risk. But the people think, okay, a minute ago, the plan was to do it this way. All of a sudden it changed. So it's a random decision. It's not a random decision. It's a very well thought out decision usually. But at, on, on the last guy in the chain <laughs> who is supposed to do it, it may look very Random, and I, but I guess that, that this, this, this is the common problem with most uh, creative people or, or directors or screenwriters that, that uh, they all have to deal with this and, and it's unavoidable. If you, and if, if you avoid this, usually the result is worse. So, so yeah, you can ship on time and do everything without any problems and changes, but the result is gonna suck in my opinion. Yeah, Dan, Dan is very opinionated on a lot of stuff, and he's a stubborn guy. But that's something that got us in the end, because without his stubbornness, we would just, uh, a lot of people would waver, a lot of people would leave the idea, we wouldn't probably get the money, the Kickstarter, everything. So he really is the engine. Uh, Daniel is an extremely creative and, and genius guy when it comes to dialogue, storytelling and this stuff. I think he more than once he, he proved this already. His games are Mafia 1, for example, is still considered one of the, like in Czech Republic, definitely one of the, maybe the best game ever from came, coming out from Czech Republic. But even from in foreign countries, Germany, Russia, whatsoever, they're talking about this game. Uh, though. What could have been different, of course, is the way uh, how fast he communicates on, on social media or how impulsive he reacts. This is something that is coming out of your characteristics. Of course, if he would <laughs> may eventually think a, a little bit more about what he's tweeting and how it can affect or how much damage it can theoretically do, because everything that seems very clear to you in 100 signs must not be clear for the other one who reads it, especially not in an argument. Let's say that, like, like, let's point it to, to some context. Uh, 
I was starting to comment all like the thing I said, the things I said that are currently like my bad and the, the, like like I said them after we were already uh, accused uh, of a lot of stuff that we didn't do. So basically, this original scandal was ha happened without our slightest input. <laughs> so they, they started to write those articles without us commenting on, on those things. So, and I decided to comment on them the moment when it was like, okay, so it doesn't matter anymore because every <laughs> it's already like everybody's shouting us. So I can only do that they will shout, keep shouting. So, so and then I realized that uh, for for many people it doesn't matter what actually happened. There, were, definitely there were controversies, but we had the controversies controversies from like through the entire development. In the end, I think it turned out pretty okay because people were judging very fast, and that's maybe the the dark side of the, the downside of social media, where you have let's say 180 signs on on Twitter, and you really fast can accuse someone of something and maybe in the end it turns out that it's not true and the very sad thing is and that's like a my absolutely personal opinion about that the very sad thing is that just imagine you're accusing someone of something whatever it is and then in all the time constantly and then in the end it turns out that you were wrong and that, that, that this accusation is not true but you damaged him at least psych psychologically I wrote the game with seven other people. They are absolutely different than me. I'm saying that there is no push of any politics in the game, as, as they constantly say, which is like ridiculous. Because I'm sitting in the office with an anarchist, the guy who has absolutely different political opinions than me, and he wrote 15% of the quests. There's other guy who is libertarian, there's other guy who is kind of like hardcore liberal. So, so, so the, like, it's, it's ridiculous to say that those people wrote the game together, but we wrote it together. So, so, and everybody wrote something different. And I would say that, that what, what's interesting is that the game is really, uh, like, touches a lot of important topics and doesn't take any conclusions, basically. We just show you, oh, this is how it was. And it's up on you if you want to solve it this way or that way. We didn't inject any crazy ideology. We didn't. We just want to make a game. I mean, we just wanted to make a game. Here, it was for a very, very long time passion-driven and inspiration-driven, where someone has an idea and want to transfer it into a game. So that be telling us that we did something on purpose to discriminate, discriminate someone or something is that hard accusation actually. This, is, this company is like over 100 people and really here are people who are open and minded and tolerant and, and stuff and we just made the game and nothing there was invented so that we uh, you know like offend anyone really and making this kind of a judgments that, that you know that, that this is like racist or um, that certain elements are lacking in the game is really unfair. It all began so toxic that I don't even want to tie those guys who helped us to it because I don't want them to be called names. So there is a 70 years old professor, probably the biggest, biggest authority on 15th century Bohemia. The guy I spoke to several times, uh, I asked him about all those controversies if it's, there's at least very little chance that something of it could happen and he was said no and and he told me how it was and basically that we have it right and but i don't want this guy to be called names in magazines because he's an old respectable professor and he doesn't need to be involved in such toxic stupid discussions it's really more about misunderstanding between uh, different cultures. Uh, we the, there is very small. Uh, the, the Czech Republic is very homogeneous 
ethnically very homogeneous country. The number of uh, non-Czech people is tiny. I got contacted a lot, but usually from the ones who wanted to uh, talk bad about us, definitely shown from, well, it was clear, A, about their uh, the, the different articles they wrote already, and uh, B, the way how they were asking. Practically, z with exception of Kotaku, but they, nobody was ever willing to ask us about our explanation. So it was like every time there, there is such article, nobody actually wants an explanation. And even if we explained before, they ignore it. So that says a lot, I would say. So, so you wrote horrible stuff about someone and you don't give him the right to kind of apologize at least. It's a strange time we live in, I would say. Um, I was learning in university that being a journal, that there are two things about journalism. One is that journalist, being a journalist, or the word journalism isn't, isn't a trademark and is not protected by anything. So everyone can call himself a journalist. Okay. But the other thing is that journalism is connected to a certain codex, which means being objective, try showing both ways, and try to keep it inform uh, like without without deeper personal opinion in that. If so, it must be marked as a commentary or something like this. This seems to sometimes not happen in video game journalism, where personal opinion affects very hard the way how you write about something. You don't need to like something, and that's totally fair, of course not, I also don't like any, everything, but you need to stay at least objective about it and try to be as neutral as possible when doing a report about something. And then somebody goes and says that Silk Road led through from Olomouc to Prague. And that some historian down the pub in London told him. And Silk Road went from China to Turkey, or <laughs> to, to Med Mediterranean Sea. We are 2000 kilometers from Mediterranean Sea. There was no Silk Road, especially not in 15th century here. And somebody in some magazine writes that there was a Silk Road in Prague, which is absolutely ridiculous statement. And based on that, he says that I'm a liar and, and you're just like, what? Like, who? Huh? And it's, it's like, how should you react if somebody like, you, you, open, you Google Silk Road and you see where it was, like, it, it's nowhere here. And everybody's like, ah. and then the reactions are like, ah, you proven them, like, thanks to historical research, you proved them lying. Like, we didn't want to, to, to talk too much about it just because we just wanted to, like, we wanted to do the game still, right? And the, the thing is, again, that's a fight which cannot be won, even though it seems like for someone it might seem like he won something, but I don't think that it's just, it's just quiet for a while and then something will come, come, come up again. So, uh, before the release I was quite okay, let's say, uh, because we also heard from some people already, people in the team played it and they said, and even the skeptical people in the team were like, so I finally played it and I like it, it's good. And even the people who didn't play games that much before started to like it. So I was like, okay, so there's a lot of people who like it, so probably there's gonna be a lot of other people outside of the company or outside of our bubble that, that will like it. So I, that was kind of fine. The big unknown were the journalists, because some of them have uh, beef with me. <laughs> so, like, I expected some personal issues being shown in the reviews, which actually happened, uh, but not as much as I was afraid. No one can ever do a 100% realistic, real thing, because it's just impossible. You always have to add here a little bit, take away there a little bit and so on and get, get up with compromises. But in the end, I hope people enjoy a really great story in which they have something to talk about. 
because what I was amazed of at PAX last week, I was talking to one fan and he was telling me about a, st a, a, a quest and a completely random dude who stood next to him was like listening to that and said, oh yeah, I had this quest as well. I didn't know you can do this. And, that, and I'm not kidding, there came, a third guy came in and said, yes, 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 and you can also do, do this and that. And I did the stealth something and the first was asking, really, how did you do that? And all of a sudden, because first he was talking to me and he wanted to shake my hand, and all of a sudden those three guys were talking to each other and I was standing there and observing and they completely ignored me. And they were just talking about this one particular quest, which they all played, but completely in a different way. And they were amazed how it's possible that there is another solution to that. And this is where I was standing there and saying like, this is exactly what we wanted to achieve. And this is exactly what we wanted. To give the people a game to experience in their own way, without us telling them what to do, just giving them some hints here and there, but ultimately to give them the chance to create their own story within this entertainment product, get lost in medieval Bohemia and then eventually talk to your friend and say about this awesome moment or this awesome story or this awesome part you saw there and amaze him because he didn't, he missed it because of something. A month before the release I was really nervous because a lot of the stuff wasn't there and the game really felt much worse than, than a month later this really huge leap forward in the last couple of weeks and it's quite normal I would say but in, with RPGs it's harder than with other games, M much harder. A lot of the things come together at really the last moment so I was nervous but I don't even know how to, how to kind of how to name this kind of emotion. When the things are beyond your control there's no reason why to be like so, so there's this kind of like expectation that you have, and you are afraid that it's not going to work out. But on the other hand, you did what you could, and then it's up in the hands of others. So, so basically, you just wait. And I've experienced some disappointments uh, before, so I was kind of prepared. If like it would be very, I wouldn't be very happy if it if it didn't work. But, but. Uh, the biggest thing is that the, the uh, that we proved proven that our philosophy behind the design of the game is correct. Many people said that the game is going to be boring because of that it's realistic, which is not true. Many people said that it's it's a niche, so nobody will buy it, even if it's good. Many people said that you need to do things in a way that everybody else does them and we proven that it's not necessary. Uh, the action or violence aspect is also important, so there's not much violence in the game and it's still fun and interesting and uh, takes very long to, to like, like, there's a lot of gameplay, uh, even without the violence, so it's, it's, all those things were quite hovering in the air when we were doing it and I was a little bit afraid, okay, so maybe it's not going to work, so what, what we will do when, when it's done and we will realize, oh, the world is too big and too empty. People have problems with that. What should we do? And they didn't have problems with it, so great.
to roll up. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, narrow roads.